What if the life you've always dreamed of is closer than you think, but it is still just beyond the wall of beliefs and habits you've carried for all your life? Imagine for a moment you're reading a book, but instead of absorbing its wisdom, someone just tells you how good the book is and makes you forget the whole thing. That would be weird, right? But is that actually what you're doing? Today on the episode, we are diving into some thought-provoking ideas and mental models that shape the choices we make every day, such as why do we chase status symbols? How do we fall into a shadow career? What makes us suckers for shortcuts over true purpose and understanding in life? Hello and welcome to the Growth Mindset Psychology Show. As always, diving into the science of self-improvement and helping you build your own personal philosophy of a life well lived. If you have been a listener for a while, you should know that we aren't about shallow fixes here. The show is definitely for the deeper thinker, the lifelong learner, someone looking to distill genuine meaning from the noise. And if you don't know who I am, I am Samuel Webster Harris, who is currently experiencing a dilemma of what to call himself, probably going with Webster. But more importantly, I started this podcast to answer bigger questions that have lived with me for years. And as I have just turned 34, I wrote this episode to cover 34 of my favorite ideas that I've been thinking about this year and would tell to a younger version of myself. It's a wide ranging list of topics and where possible, I've strung them together into logical sequences. So there's a sense of journey and progress as it goes along. I really love hearing these types of episodes from other people. I thought Kevin Kelly's personal life lessons list was really good. So if you enjoy this episode and want to check out more things like this, that's for you. But either way, I invite you to soak in some of the different ideas and reconsider beliefs that you might not have noticed are holding you back or perhaps pushing you off track. It's going to be a fun, easy episode to listen to. So stay tuned. Okay, starting at the start. It's not the number of books you read, but the number that you understand. I'm sure you know that we forget what people say, but we remember how they make us feel. It's the same with books. If you race through a book and rush on to the next one, you are essentially building an array of book reviews in your mind where you will remember how good a bunch of different books were, but you won't have learned any of the principles within them or practiced the lessons they have taught you. When you read things, you're lucky if you retain 10% of the information. Yet if you put a lot more time in and you teach, you could retain as much as 90% of it. So engage with the book that you read, make notes, argue with the ideas, talk about them with others, and even try making your own summaries of the best parts and teaching it to others. Number two, are you pursuing a shadow career? This is a direct quote from Stephen Pressfield. He asks, are you getting a PhD in Elizabethan studies because you are afraid to write the tragedies and comedies you know that you have inside you? Are you living the drugs and booze half of the musician's life without actually writing the music? Are you working in a support capacity for an innovator because you're afraid to risk being an innovator yourself? If you are dissatisfied with your current life, ask yourself what your current life is a metaphor for and that metaphor will point you towards your real calling. Number three, you don't need a side hustle. It might seem like everyone is running a podcast or a newsletter or an Etsy store and they might even be talking about all the benefits of how well they're doing but they won't be telling you about all the things that they are missing out on. As Socrates says, beware the barrenness of a busy life. In fact, when it comes to side hustles, only 9% of them generate a meaningful income, yet 60% of side hustles result in having burnout at some point. So whatever you do in your free time, it should really be an outlet for you. It could be a creative hobby or a sport, but it should be done for the love of doing it rather than an external goal. Number four, you do need an exercise habit. You probably heard it before, but I am going to say it again. As Edward Stanley says, those who think they have no time for bodily exercise will sooner or later have to find some time for their illness. Ultimately, if you skip doing exercise, you'll start aging much faster mentally and physically. So lift something heavy, do some cardio, go dancing, take up pickleball. It doesn't actually matter what you do. You don't need to break any records. You don't need to be an athlete. It's just important to find something that you can enjoy doing and be stronger. Number five, you do your best work when you aren't working. 
in much the same way that muscles grow at rest, not during the workout, so do ideas. You need to give them time to breathe and grow without your vigilance. That means having multiple interests, a regular exercise habit, as we've mentioned. Maybe some true downtime is actually the best way to create an environment for big ideas and good work to happen. If you are always working and striving for inspiration, you can actually prevent and block good ideas from surfacing. Freud reminds us that the mind is like an iceberg. It floats with only one seventh of its bulk above water. Now, of course, that doesn't mean just don't work at all. You do have to put time into things and work hard. And sometimes when you're trying to be creative, you might need to get a bunch of bad ideas out first, like having a tap for the bad water that you just need to run for a while until the good stuff comes out. And that leads me to my next idea, that you should treat ideas like stepping stones. Ideas are actually very cheap, and most of them are wrong. But working on them will improve your ability to have ideas and execute on them. So you should treat them as stepping stones to your next thing. Don't Wait 30 years to finally write your book idea so that you're ready to do it perfectly. Just write the best book that you can do today and then write another book in a few years time. You'll be surprised in 30 years that you will be so much better at writing books. It's not about ideas, it's about making them happen. Next, remember the fact that money is just a tool. You can trade money for the time of other people or their assets, which is something they put time into making. And that's all money is. So it's worth answering for yourself, how much of other people's time or their stuff do you need to live the life you want? And when you come to an idea of how needy you are, how much of your own time are you willing to spend to get that from others? Ultimately, you'll find that monetary transactions are always a trade and your time isn't free. As Will Rogers says, too many people spend money they haven't earned to buy things they don't want to impress people they don't like. And that leads us to the next point, Life is too short to pursue the wrong things. As we've mentioned, money is great sometimes, but losing 10 years of your life and perhaps missing your kids grow up or sacrificing your health or simply having a very boring decade in your 20s instead of exploring the world and living your life, those are all very high costs to pay just for some money. So make sure you know how to enjoy yourself before you start chasing money and waste half of it on the wrong things and find out later that you could have earned half as much money and enjoyed an extra decade of your life in a better position. There's a quote that says, the cost of not following your heart is to spend the rest of your life wishing you had. Next, we have one of the most important life lessons of all. That is, it doesn't matter what you do, it's how you do it. We've all had two different teachers that taught the same subject and one teacher had a warmth and a curiosity that was infectious. And that made them a good teacher and an interesting person to be around. Whatever you do in life, it's your approach that counts. We can be so focused on what we think is the outcome, the exam result, the number in the bank, the job, the partner, but what matters is how you show up every day in pursuit of your goals. That is what will make you truly happy and not the actual goal itself. You don't hike a trail because you want to be at the end of it, you hike because you want to go hiking. So take snacks, play some games, enjoy the view. Don't take it all too seriously. Right, now we have a cool concept that is practice the emotions you want to feel. If you don't practice being calm and content, it's very hard to feel calm and content. You actually lose the capacity for it. A stressed entrepreneur who is constantly putting out fires every day for years becomes wired for stress. If they sell their business and have nothing to do, They can't just relax and feel happy because they aren't wired for it. Their brain's wiring is so used to just dealing with problems that they'd see problems everywhere. Don't get stuck in a cycle of practicing a feeling that you don't want in your life. Some interesting statistics. A gratitude practice creates a 25% increase in happiness. A meditation practice gives a 30% reduction in stress. Practicing self-compassion results in a 40% increase in a positive emotional state. Now, those are, of course, things we are commonly told to do, but they are hard. But the interesting thing behind each of those statistics was that they required the word practice. You have to put time into practicing feeling them. As John Milton says, the mind is its own place, and in itself it can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. The next idea is that you need to find out who you are. To do that, spend some time alone, travel the world, have a high-pressure job, have a low pressure job, be in a life or death situation, 
Spend 10 days in a meditation retreat where it is just you battling your own mind with nothing else. And read some psychology. Ultimately, there is not enough information in your genetics that will tell you what you are capable of. You have to find that all out by yourself. As Aristotle says, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. And on that, the next lesson is that it takes time to find your own personal voice. It's really interesting to realize that you do have to achieve a certain level of skill in painting to be able to express yourself in your own style as a painter. It's the same in writing. It takes time to build those skills to have the artistry to write in your real voice. And if you want to get there, it actually helps to copy others. A basketball player practices footwork on YouTube. A director copies filming techniques. A comedian will study joke styles. You have to build a foundation first that will then evolve into you being able to express yourself in your own voice. Something I've said before is that Picasso took years to develop the style of Picasso. Mr. Beast took years to develop the style of Mr. Beast. Mark Manson took years to develop the writing style of Mark Manson. So get your 10,000 hours in in something you care about doing and don't worry about being perfect straight away. And on the subject of 10,000 hours, discipline is more important than talent. Again, quoting Stephen Pressfield here, you're way better if you have giant discipline than giant talent. Discipline itself and the act of repeatedly showing up builds talent and it allows you to create great work. There's a saying that we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then must not be an act, but a habit. And research shows that discipline is a stronger predictor of success than IQ in over 75% of cases, which is why IQ isn't everything. But don't let that trip you up, because the next lesson here is that IQ is an unfair advantage. Sadly, 99% of us aren't in the top 1% of IQ. And so it's natural to run into confirmation bias where we see an intelligent person doing something very stupid and we think IQ means nothing. But IQ is, at a simple fundamental level, the ability to understand patterns and results, and that means you can learn faster and predict the future better. Of course, cognitive biases or ego could get in the way of someone with IQ, and it makes smart people do stupid things. And as we've seen, an intelligent person with a lack of discipline will block them from ever making the use of it. However, believing that IQ means nothing is unhelpful and denies reality. I'm going to name a few names. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos. Those were some of the world's most successful leaders who all started giant mega companies and had the ability to keep ownership whilst they grew them. They were all in the top 10 of the world's richest people and each of them had an IQ of above 150. That is in the top 0.1% of raw intelligence. Having success building an absolutely giant company from nothing requires a gift of understanding the world and the patterns within it. And there is no getting around that fact. So whatever your IQ is, you should apply yourself accordingly if you want to be successful. For example, Mr. Beast, he has an IQ of 111, which is in the top 35% of people, but it's nowhere near the top 1%. Now to win at YouTube, he needs to understand YouTube. And he put in 80,000 hours into understanding the platform so he could become the best person at it. Now, there are less balls in the air to make a high retention video than to make mind-blowing technology that changes the world. So he won at YouTube through sheer effort and still intelligence, but it didn't require the same level that it took to build X or the iPhone. But he played a game that he could win at and he absolutely dedicated himself to it. So whatever you want to do in life, you need to understand your own level and how much effort it's going to take and apply yourself accordingly. Often a good way to get there is to not be the best at one single individual thing, like you're unlikely to be the best tennis player in the world, but if you can be in the top 10% at three quite different skills, you might end up being in the top 0.1% of people that has those three skills together and you can still build an impressive amount of talent. And on this topic of intelligence, the next is that it is very intelligent to make other people feel clever. You don't impress people by confusing them with your intelligence. You impress them by empowering them to understand things that no one else could explain to them before. Intelligence isn't a zero-sum game where you win by being smarter than others, so don't try to prove you're smarter than them. Ultimately, the human collective becomes smarter because we have books, the internet, and you become smarter because of everything in the world before you. So it follows direct logic that making other people more intelligent actually makes you more intelligent. 
And as we learned from the topic of how much you forget of a book, you literally retain so much more from it if you do a good job of teaching other people. So as I said, the best thing you can do is make other people feel clever by helping them understand things. This is Think Bigger. I'm sure you've heard of this before, but it's a bit like a cognitive bias that we don't realize how small our thinking is. A lot of us feel like maybe we're moving slowly and we can blame the world or our lack of opportunities, but this is usually like being in a car and blaming the traffic when in reality, you're actually just stuck in second gear and there is no traffic. All of Mr. Beast's success came from him thinking bigger. He gives a hypothetical example of a YouTube video title. You could put a video together saying, I spent 50 hours in my backyard. It's kind of hard to do, not very exciting. Instead, if you think bigger, I survived 50 hours in ketchup, and that's exciting and fundamentally watchable. Many people start a Substack or a business or a podcast, and they have very unexciting or uncompelling ideas. Maybe they build an app with one small feature change that a competitor doesn't have, or they'll run a podcast where they interview anyone over coffee, and surprisingly, no one cares. So do something that no one else is doing that is noteworthy and set a higher bar for yourself. What do you really want to be doing in 10 years time? As John Shedd says, a ship in harbour is safe, but that is not what ships are built for. Do something bigger. A point that might help you here is the next one, that no one thinks about you as much as you do. Much as we think that people might care about the coffee stain on our trousers that actually no one notices, this is also the reason why we think recording a podcast conversation over coffee is an interesting, cool idea, when the reality is that no one will listen to it. We forget that everyone's just lost in their own world to care that much about ours, which is why it's so important to think bigger rather than being wrapped up in our own world. Classic quote here from Eleanor Roosevelt is that you wouldn't worry so much about what others think of you if you realize how seldom they do. And on that, the next point is to make your own personal life story interesting. And by life story, I mean that each day of your life is a page in a book. And as you experience your life, you are the only person who has to read every page. So you may as well do some interesting things or crazy things because it adds variety and it makes your life interesting for you. Cycle across a continent instead of taking another package holiday. Write a book instead of doing some sporadic blogging or watching TikTok. Ask that person out. It doesn't matter if things fail or go wrong. That's also more interesting than doing nothing. As Richard Branson says, if your dreams don't scare you, they are too small. Okay, time for a quick break to talk about our sponsors who keep the show running before we'll be back with the second half of my life lessons for the year. Okay, on to the next point. One of my favorite mental models, that is to use first principles thinking. And I know this does get spoken about a lot these days, but you can't let ideas in your head of what is possible break the fundamental rules of physics. There's no law in the universe that says you will always meet crappy partners or that you can't give a speech. Just because there are ways of doing things in society or in the field that you work in that have always been done in that way doesn't mean it can't be done differently. 78% of successful innovators attribute their breakthroughs to questioning assumptions and rethinking traditional approaches. As an example, I have a totally weird outro on my show that's unlike anything I've heard anywhere else. If you've listened before, you know I have some completely silent pauses, I do odd bits of whispering and shouting, and for some odd reason I even tell people to not listen to more podcasts, which is an interesting choice for a podcaster, but there is no reason I can't put any form of audio I dream up into the end of the audio file of a podcast episode. Like, why do you have to finish every episode with, this podcast was produced by this people, thanks for listening, give me a rating. There's no law of physics that says that's what you have to do. And on the subject of breaking rules, having just said that rule of not following others, my next rule is to learn from others. Yeah, as I said, I put this together in a seamless order. Anyway, the lesson is that smart people learn from the mistakes of other people, whereas dumb people make their own mistakes from scratch. So don't be dumb. Learn from other people's mistakes. Read books, engage with your peers, or where relevant, use a coach that can result in 50% faster personal growth because they have knowledge they can give to you to save you flapping around trying to learn it. Equally, if you see people struggling with something or messing something up, let's say someone runs a business and some parts of it are quite crap, don't assume that it's really easy to run that business and that if you start that business, you will definitely be better than them. 
Often in life, we aren't smarter or more organized than other people that are having problems. And we should actually pay attention to the problems they're having and learn from them rather than assume that we won't have them. Next rule, the classic lesson that too much of anything is bad. Also, even people. If you've ever been to Britain, I'm sure you know that fish and chips are great. But for five days in a row, it's really bad and you would never want to do that. However, some things like cereal, you can eat that every day for breakfast and it's kind of fun. But that doesn't mean it isn't nice to have a break every now and then. And people can also be like food. Some people you only want in very small bursts and that's it for the year. Whereas other people you do want to spend most of your time with, but it can still be very good to take a break from them. If you go traveling and spend an intense amount of time with someone or you live with them and both work from home, it can amplify little things about them that are annoying. Yet if you have a day off to go explore a city without them, for example, you might appreciate the freedom and yet you'll find yourself starting to have a chance to miss them. So if you find yourself focusing on the flaws of someone, it's quite possible you're just spending too much time with them. You just need a very short break. Okay, the next point is that society as we know it is an accident. What we live in now is not a finely crafted end goal of an intelligent evolution process. It is a series of accidents, fortunate and unfortunate, that over a long-term trend have gone in what I think is a better direction. If you look at genetic evolution in biology, it's a process of genetic mutations where most of them are just crap and sometimes you'll get the odd one that is a benefit. Lots of things go wrong in life and actually that's fine. Studies show that 85% of modern inventions were accidental discoveries or found through unintentional consequences. Ultimately in life, things don't go to plan. Instead of being annoyed when things go wrong, we should realize that nearly all the good things in life come from the odd unplanned thing as well. For example, I once had a plane cancelled and had a pretty terrible morning sorting my life out to run to the other side of Portugal to get a plane from somewhere else, but I had to make it back for my mother's birthday. And when I got to this second plane that I shouldn't be on, I then met my girlfriend in the cube. Complete accident, which if I'd spent the whole morning just being annoyed and having the vibes of an angry stressed person, I probably wouldn't have been in a state to attract a potential life partner, but because I was chilled and not caring, I was open to the possible upsides of the unplanned plane cancellation disaster. And in general, we should just take everything less seriously, because the world is very random. If you think about all the projects you've ever worked on, often you'll find the last 5 or 10% a maybe even the last 50% was done in a rushed together last minute chaotic process. A lot of what you see in the world, companies, the projects that they run, they are results of a lot of individuals finally getting their act together and throwing things together at the last minute. The world as you know it is basically duct taped together. We take so much in the world so seriously, so many laws, practices, we think of as these everlasting important things that someone ultimately did just make up. And on the subject of making things up, as I'm talking about how things are all made up and how society is so unplanned, it's interesting to think about a society that's completely differently. And on that, I would say that North Korea itself is an incredibly misunderstood place. As they say, the greatest obstacle to discovery is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge. Something I found is that because of the way that we learn about North Korea, We assume that every human in North Korea is living a terrible existence with their lack of human rights and we have a very fixed definition of freedom. But I would say that North Korea is different. In North Korea, there is no advertising anywhere infecting your mind with the concept that you are not enough until you buy the deodorant or the car or the holiday. There's no journalism showing how your country is going to complete hell. There's no freedom of political speech, which is something we find hard to wrap our heads around, but there is a defined path of rules you can follow, which if you walk down them, you have complete peace and freedom of whatever the hell else you want to say, and no one's really going to care or tell you off about it. So the next point is that you should really question and find flaws in things that you take for granted. If you're reading a book that you love and you think is brilliant, or you have a favorite teacher that you listen to and you believe everything they say, you should still learn to question some of it. Or likewise, if you don't like something and you're against it, you should be able to at least find some of the positives in it, like some of the ideas I've spoken about with North Korea. It's really weird for a Westerner to wrap their minds around North Korea because it seems like a place with absolutely no freedom, yet there is actually a lot of freedom that we don't personally ever get to experience because we don't know what that's like. In North Korea, they don't have anxiety about the bajillion things they aren't doing 
and they are more at peace with their life choices as long as they don't talk about political opinions, their opinions don't really offend anyone. Whereas here in the rest of the world, if I have a political opinion, or even right now me saying these ideas about North Korea, it's probably offending someone. And on that point, I should really state, I totally don't agree with the concept of North Korea or their methodology, and I don't advocate for North Korean principles towards human rights in the slightest at all. I don't think it's good. I think it's terrible. And I just want to make sure that is understood. I saw firsthand the effects of starvation on people's bodies, and I wouldn't wish that on anyone or think that such a form of political dictatorship could ever be acceptable. But just because you don't agree with the society and think that it is bad, doesn't mean that it is a cognitive waste to not look for some potential upsides or benefits in there, even if they are hard to consider. When I went to North Korea, it was the most upside down place I've ever been to in my life, but I found it really fascinating to learn that a human society can exist with completely different values to those that we have in the entire rest of the world. And people can still find happiness and freedoms that we don't have ourselves. And this leads on to my next point, that you should build your own beliefs. You shouldn't trust the news or your favorite influencer or blogger or podcaster as a source of information. And you should really learn to try and identify your beliefs that come from the society around you and really try to avoid getting caught up in any ideology that is an ism. I'm not saying that some isms don't have some good beliefs within them, but any ideology that you take on has a level of inflexibility and becomes a lens that stops you from interpreting the world for yourself in your own way and becomes a set of cognitive shortcuts. The reason I gave North Korea as an example was how North Korea is ruled and recognize the terrible nature of it and it's bad and thus we then assume that everything about it is bad and that blinds us to curiosity. In the same way, the poison of a snake bite could kill a young boy and that is bad. But the poison itself is not necessarily a bad thing and if you stay open-minded and curious, you might find out that the poison itself in the right quantities could, can be used for medicinal purposes and even save lives. But if you have your blinders on and you see one bad thing and assume everything is bad, you can never find the upsides in life. And you need to be able to learn to think for yourself. And the problem with isms, such as capitalism, communism, Stoicism, Buddhism, whatever, they may have many brilliant qualities, but they are a set of beliefs that someone else has given you that you don't actually form yourself. And you should form all of your opinions individually and always be open to questioning them. In fact, the Buddha even said, believe nothing. No matter where you read it or who has said it, not even if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. So you should question societal norms sometimes, and I think it really helps you develop a stronger sense of identity and who you are. As we have spoken about, you need to know who you are. And I think that's really hard if we grow up being taught to believe things like you have to get this type of job to be happy, when that may well not be true. On that, keep your identity small. Being too caught up in who you are can stop you from being who you could be. Politics and religion, for example, are minefields to talk about because they engage in so many different people's identities. And some people get really offended and having an identity makes them easily offended. In fact, some people can get offended just by their time being wasted or by being given a mediocre coffee or having some feedback like their writing could be better. If it wasn't part of their identity, they wouldn't be offended by it, but instead they are. Paul Graham says that if people can't think clearly about something, it's usually because it has become part of their identity. If all other things are equal, the best plan is to let as few things into your identity as possible. That's why I said earlier that you shouldn't take on following any different form of ism. Okay, let's talk about biases for a second and the fact that they basically boil down to a consistent belief system, where we have a more generic confirmation bias that kind of rules them all. The idea is that we are less concerned about verifying the accuracy of our existing beliefs and we're much more concerned with maintaining and strengthening our existing beliefs, regardless of what those beliefs are or where they came from, which is why it's so important. Keep your beliefs and identity small and not follow too many different isms. In fact, within each person, we have a set of six very core beliefs that create pretty much all the rest of our other biases. The first one is that we believe our own experience is a reasonable reference point. Then we believe that we make correct assessments about the world. We of course believe that we are good people. We believe that our group is a reasonable reference point. We believe that the members of our group are good people. And we believe that things about people shape outcomes as opposed to context and chance shaping outcomes. And that's why we believe that bad things happen because people are evil or that members outside of our group have something against us. Or we're terrible at picking company stocks because we think that we know what we're doing. 
as Isaac Asimov says, your assumptions are your windows on the world. Scrub them off every once in a while or the light won't come through. Now, to go deeper onto this, I stated the idea that everyone believes they are good and most actions of most people are completely understandable if you were in their position with their experiences. Most arguments and conflicts are often not because one side is inherently bad and evil, but because both sides misunderstand each other. In fact, we can improve our understanding of other people by 40% simply by just opening up to the idea that people might have positive intentions or a reason behind their actions instead of assuming that they are bad. It's easy to call narcissists evil instead of thinking them are scared and needing help. But when you look at the world with empathy, it becomes a much nicer place. And on the subject of the world being a nice place, it's important to remember that life is about contrasts. If you had absolutely nothing to do for a day, that would be nice. But for a whole year, it would be really boring. You need to work to enjoy rest and you need to be hungry to enjoy food. As they say, without the rain, there would be no rainbow. You'll see all things in life are trades and it's often the really bad things that make the funniest stories that we look back on with the most joy. So instead of rushing to avoid the difficulties, realize that the beauty in life lies in its contrasts and that nothing can be good without something being bad. And it gets a lot easier if you're happy to pay the fee instead of trying to avoid it and looking for shortcuts or cheat codes because they don't exist and they actually make things much worse. And on the subject of making things worse, here's a point and that is that anger is mostly a useless emotion. If you suffer an injustice, it feels like it's your responsibility to be angry. But holding on to anger is like holding a hot coal because revenge is a myth. For every minute you remain angry, you're giving up 60 seconds of your own peace of mind. There's a story from the 1970s of a man called Kirsch who was cheated in a business deal. He then spent the next decade trying to sue anyone involved. In the process, he drained all of his own personal finances trying to hurt other people's, he lost his job, and he estranged his own family. This is a much, much higher cost than the initial business loss, and it was entirely self-inflicted. He could have just taken the loss, moved on with his life, and carried on being happy. For every minute of your life that you are angry, you lose 60 seconds of your own peace of mind. Now onto the final two. Here's a philosophical one about camera angles and stories. If you watch a novice YouTube video of someone taking a hike, maybe in somewhere beautiful like Nepal, they'll be showing these panoramic views where they're constantly sweeping the camera across the scene and every new shot is moving and moving and moving and it becomes disorientating and hard to watch. Casey Neistat is a brilliant YouTuber and he has a rule that 9 out of every 10 shots must be completely still. It's better to let the cloud swirl or a bird fly through the shot than to spin the camera and try to get everything into the video. Weirdly, keeping the camera still and focused on just a small part of the scenery actually captures the spirit of the place better and makes the viewer feel closer and more like they are there than giving them a 360 spin of the epic valley or wherever you're at. And this physical nuance in how you use the camera lens can be much the same in things like writing. In writing, we often want to make several points to show everything that there is to know. But actually, it can often be better to focus on a single good story in depth that the reader really relates to better and retains and feels like they're there. The point that I'm making here is that often we want to convey everything, show people how awesome we are or how much knowledge we know. But putting in too much work, trying to cover everything actually gets much less across than choosing the right little thing to focus on that gets the message across that we want. And in almost all cases, doing less actually does much more. Which leads me on to the final point that not only are the big things the big things, but so are the really small things. So in terms of the big things in life, what you do for a living, where you live, who your partner is, those are the really big fundamental life choices that are so important to determine the quality of your life. But also, the really little things determine the quality of your life. How you perceive threat and safety, the tone of your voice. What do you think about when your mind is free? And I think that last question of what your mind thinks about when it's free is the perfect question to end on. As it's my birthday, it would be an amazing gift to me if you have listened to the show for a while. If you felt like leaving me a positive review, that would be hugely appreciated and a wonderful present. And it does make a world of difference to me as a podcaster and how people see the show and find it. And I'd love to carry on doing this next year. When my own mind is free, I like to think about abstract ideas from psychology or philosophy 
and wonder what the hell it all means, and it's truly a great honour that I then get to spend my time chasing answers to those curious musings and call it work. I really hope this show helps you see the world and your own thinking from new perspectives and gives you some slightly more positive or curious things to think about when your own mind is free. Thank you so much for listening. Your consistency to reach the end of an episode is legendary. But when we learn things, it's important to reflect. So I politely invite you to take a pause, rifle through the biggest ideas you just heard. So here's your opportunity to hit pause and have a think. Okay, did you wrestle with some insights? Information doesn't stick when we race from one podcast to the next without using our brain to play with the knowledge. So here's another go at a pause. Alrighty, I'll let you off to continue with your life now. If you have any ideas or feedback for the show, I'm always interested to hear from you. You're the best! And other than that, please stay curious. Curious. Grown. Smiling for no reason.